Mrs. Lee's only daughter, Wailing, paid this tribute to her mother. Mama was a studying influence on me for most of my life. I've always felt strongly about injustice or the un unnecessary suffering of humans and animals. I used to be very upset when the police came to shoot stray dogs in the Istana grounds. So from young, I was perpetually on missions, as I saw them, to right wrongs, most of which were not my duty to right. Mama understood how passionately I felt about these missions. She did not stop me, but would calmly put things into perspective for me and gently bring me down to earth. When I was miserable because I failed in a mission, she was simply there for me, knowing words to recall comfort. As I grew older, I was more controlled in the way I took on challenges and confided less in Mama. But her very presence when I failed in any mission was comforting. Once I had an accident while on holiday in New Zealand. The car was totaled and it was a miracle I was not killed. I carried on with my hiking plans after getting another vehicle from the car rental company. I did not inform my parents, and I congratulated myself for being so cool. But the subconscious worry that my injury or death would have hurt them persisted. So when I landed at Changi Airport, I immediately called home and said, Ma, I'm home safe. I had forgotten that my usual habit was to greet my parents only when I got home. My mother realized I must have been in danger. She told my cousin Kim Lee, something happened to Ling on this trip. I'd rather not, not know what it is, what it was. I think Mama and Papa's most significant influence on me was to teach me to treat people from all walks of life with the same empathy and kindness. Mama herself treated people as her equals, regardless of their social status. Even during the last illness, she treated her WSOs with kindness and courtesy. Many of her former WSOs SMS me for permission to visit her. In the initial months after her devastating stroke in May 2008, she was still able to recognize them and continue to treat them as young friends. One WSO related to me how Mama, even after the third and nearly fatal bleed into her brain, joked with that young woman, when are you going to have babies? You shouldn't just be studying your books all the time. Mama was the one I ran to when I was hurt as a child, when I felt played out, or when I was simply sad because I felt life had been unfair to me, or to my pets, or to an injured wild animal in the starter grounds. As I grew older, I stopped bothering her with these trivialities. But she continued to be there for me when I needed her most. Mama taught me how to swear to her and to be an upright human being. On rare occasions when I was a child, she punished me by cleaning. But it was always in circumstances when I knew I deserved the punishment. The final two and a half years of Mama's life was painful. Is only by Papa's enduring and limitless love. But we must remember, Mama had 87 years of happiness, beginning from her childhood in a close-knit family, through her school years and then university. She found a perfect partner and spouse in my father. She was happy with and proud of her three children. She enjoyed and was successful in her profession. While I mourn Mama's passing, I'm grateful to have had her for 55 years. I am who I am, partly because of my genetic makeup, but also because of the way in which I was brought up. I firmly believe that you should treat others in the same way you wish others to treat you. Mama taught me that social hierarchies exist, but we must not treat people differentially according to their position in society. And Mr. Lee Sien Yang, youngest child of Madam Kwa and Mr. Minister Mentor Lee, had this to say about his late mother. Although Mama encouraged all three children to strive for academic excellence, I never felt pressured. Perhaps it is because I was the youngest child. In fact, Mama would sometimes tease me as having the youngest child syndrome. 
Mama supported my numerous extracurricular activities, including swimming, canoeing, the military band, and the Singapore Youth Orchestra. She often would say that she's a warrior by nature, and I know she must have worried. Luckily, her worries about these interfering with my academic achievements proved to be unfounded. When I went away to university, Mama and I would correspond regularly. She was good at reading between the lines, and before long, she realized she noticed the frequency that Fern was being mentioned in my letters. They arranged to meet for tea on the lawn in front of Sri Tamase. I'm sure there was mutual trepidation. Thankfully, Mama and Fern hit it off very well. And although Fern was competitive enough to learn to knit, so that I would not only wear Mama's sweaters, hand-knitted sweaters, they had a warm relationship with many common interests besides knitting. Soon after we married in 1981, Fern and I started receiving hints that grandchildren were due. These messages started quite subtly, but by 1984, when I went off to Camberley to attend Staff College, and Fern was a young lawyer working in the City of London, Mama wrote to us to say, I can understand you're waiting a year or even two to run in your marriage, but it really is about time you got on with starting a family. Mama was thrilled thus when she heard news of Fern's pregnancy soon after and proceeded to knit numerous baby booties in anticipation. She knitted baby blue ones, white ones, lemon ones, and peppermint green ones, but no pink ones. She must have been prescient. Our firstborn, Sheng Wu, was a boy, and we still have those booties today. The following year, in 1986, Fern delivered our second baby, yet another boy, Huan Wu. Mama rushed to NUH, obviously thrilled and delighted, declaring, thank goodness it's a boy. If the baby had been a tiger girl, just think what difficulty we would have had marrying a tiger girl off. Our third son, Shao, was born a decade later and is much younger than all Mama's other grandchildren. When Shao arrived in 1985, Mama was already 74 and had given up hope of any more grandchildren. In corporate parlance, Shao was an unexpected bonus issue. Shao was greeted with great delight, and she pronounced that she now had one granddaughter and six grandsons. She said she thought the Chinese had a saying about qi xing yi yue, or the moon and seven stars. I think the seven stars are the great dipper. So all we needed to do was to produce another grandson to complete her family. Sadly, neither Fern nor Ho Ching obliged. In October 2003, soon after Papa's 80th birthday, Mama suffered her first stroke. This stroke left her much weaker and fragile. That she was less mobile and could not do many things for herself was a source of tremendous frustration for her. Although Papa had been accustomed to being looked after by his mother during his childhood, and by Mama after they got married, they now reversed roles. From the outset, Papa helped, cajoled, and encouraged her in her rehabilitation. He continued to care for her with an infinite amount of patience, love, kindness, and good humor. He adjusted his routine to accommodate her, changing circumstances and physical condition. His abiding love, devotion, and care must have been a great comfort to her and an inspiration to Fern and me on how to manage a lifelong partnership through good health and illness. When we married in 1981, Papa wrote Fern and me a letter with advice on marriage. Of his relationship with Mama, he said, we have never allowed the other to feel abandoned and alone in any moment of crisis. 
Quite the contrary, we have faced all major crises in our lives together, sharing our fears and hopes in our subsequent grief and exaltation. These moments of crisis have bonded us together. With the years, the number of special ties which we too have shared have increased. Some of them we share with the children. Papa has lived his love and commitment throughout these difficult, last difficult years. Fern and I, and our three sons, Shengwu, Huanu, and Xiao, miss Mama dearly. We will cherish her memory. Mrs. Lee's granddaughter, Siu Qi, eldest daughter of Prime Minister Li Sin Lung, delivered a tribute full of simple personal anecdotes. Before stroke, she was a power woman. She ran the Oxley Road household like a tight ship. She paid the maids, she did the buying of the fish, she quality checked the cooking, and she peeled my grandfather's food and packed his suitcase. She exercised rigorously every day and at not a single extra calorie, which preserved her hourglass figure for her many gorgeous chungsams. She was no nonsense, and she did not believe in making small talk or nattering on the phone with other women. Then her stroke struck in 2003 while she was in London. Shocked by the news, me and my friends prayed fervently for a recovery, and thank God the next day she made a miraculous recovery. I flew over to visit her in the East London Hospital. She had regained consciousness, and the doctor was asking her a standard set of questions to assess her cognitive function. Questions such as, is it day or night? Do you know who I am? Do you know who you are? What's your name? She was answering until he got to the question, do you know who is the Prime Minister? Nanette got cross and said, of course I know who the Prime Minister is. And after that, she refused to answer any more questions because she felt the doctor was talking to her like she was stupid. That was when I knew she was back to normal. Many more things changed at Oxley Road. Now my grandfather had to peel his own fruit, peel her fruit for her, pack his own suitcase and make his own Milo. For the first time in a while, he had to handle money so he could pay the maids. My granny locked the money in one place and she kept the keys to lock in another totally unrelated place. My granddad complained, dear, you need to have a system. And she retorted, this is the system. This is my system. And that was that. So for the first time in my life, my granny was helpless because she experienced a physical handicap. And it did definitely give her frustration. But I knew that she was also secretly happy to be taken care of. And she acquired the glow of a girl who knew that she was adored. I always felt sad that her aging body did not allow her to do the things that her soul wanted to do, such as to roam the streets window shopping, eat more desserts, or move around freely. And the most terrible thing was when she got locked in syndrome and she could no longer move nor communicate. It pained me imagining how agonizing it would be to be in her position, just lying there for months while others ate, drank, moved around, and talked. But ever the survivor, Nainai overcame multiple infections in her locked-in state, and those were infections that people thought would kill her. A big thank you must go to her wonderful security officers who and her nursing staff who facilitated her life with a lot of love. The post-stroke Nainai was a person who was full of life. If I could spend more years with her, and if she was able-bodied, there would still be so many things to see, to do, and to talk about, and to taste. And I miss her very much, and indeed, I have full assurance that one day I will get to spend that time with her. Thank you. Touching remembrances of the late Mrs. Lee Kuan Yew, this has been Singapore Tonight. Thanks for your company.